Tony, what's going on? I hate being late. It's all good. And uh, um, I um, went to two places to try and have lunch. (laughs) Like planning this. Okay, I want to eat before the the podcast starts. I want to be energetic because I know you're going quite a while. Yeah. It was due to long form. And I went to the first place. And there was a lineup. And then I went to the second place. And there was a lineup. And I was like, oh, my God. And uh, so I just raced back in here. Let me uh, let me um, have a sip of water. Yeah. Filled with a secret elixir in here. <laughs> what is it, tequila? I could use some. Yeah. Sounds it. It's, uh, no, man, it's, it's, uh, it's crazy how busy I am. And it's just, it's just nonstop. I'm actually. And that, that's what I've been seeing. It's great. It's, it's like the world's finally, I don't want to say waking up, but it seems like the ripples of what you're doing, more and more people are paying attention. Is that, is that true? Or is that just my perception? Dude, you know, I, I, it's, it's, there's a part of me that's such a wimp, (laughs) like, like in the, not, not in the, that sense, but like emotionally, I'm really a poet. And I, I, I wanted people to, to love what we're doing for the longest time. Uh, uh, and, and in the truest sense of being this romantic poet, it's, it's saddened me. Like literally, in, like in the 80s, I was sad that I was ostracized and ridiculed by uh, so many of the reality-based self-defense uh, community um you know who do you think you are bruce lee coming up with your own approach da, 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 da. and i'd be like what, what are you talking about like like this is this is this is just different it's adding on it's it's augmenting it's amplifying so uh so it's neat it's weird uh it, you know in the last few years the uh it, it's it's almost it's It makes me blush, like sometimes when people refer to me and how they refer to me, because I don't feel like I'm 62. My body does, but (laughs) my mind, mind, I don't feel like I'm 62. Yeah. Uh, And so to have, like, like you know, our main business is training law enforcement, military, public safety. So, like, I'll call people back. I still do like the hosting call interviews. Mm -hmm. Someone will say, "Hey, we'd like to host a spirit course," and I'll call up. I want to talk to the guy. It'd be like, like, like Jeremy, if you called, if you sent an email on our hosting form, hey, we'd like to host, you'd get a phone call from me, the founder, Jeremy, why do you want to host? Right. And you'd be like, who is this? And I go, it's Tony Blauer. And then people are like, oh my God, Mr. Blauer. And I'm like, hey, like, that's my dad, you know, call me. It was, it was, it, it was, it's, it's kind of neat after all these years to thank you for noticing. Well, and it's, and it's deserved, you know, and, and it's, you know, because I, I've known who you are for a long time and, and, you know, just a throw to the audience, you know, you were on episode 108, still the only episode that we um, ever released a censored and uncensored version. <laughs> Cause I sat down, I did the editing at that point and I sat down, I was like, all right. Oh, cause the, I still have all the sheets and yours so fill this box and then I was on here. And it was here. It was going through. All right, we're gonna. So, but but we released it in two different versions. We released an edited and an unedited because, um, Not for young. because you know for for authenticity purposes. But you also said such, such great stuff that we wanted people to be able to hear it if they didn't want to hear that stuff. And so, you know, I, I just got to I got to interrupt you. Sorry. Yeah, go for it. No, it's all good. I was on a call with uh, one of my team in Austria today, and. Uh, she held up like a document like that, but it was like a hundred pages thick. She said, I've been, uh, cause I teach live every week, right? On Zoom yeah. uh, four times a week. And um, uh, she had them, she had a bunch of calls. Like if, if, if a particular class really impacted her, she'd have it trans, uh, transcribed. Yeah. So uh, she goes, it's funny <laughs> because the, the otter trans, the uh, artificial intelligence, it will, it, it creates a separate section of, mo- of most commonly used words. <laughs> and my, my, my thing, can you guess what it is? Are you going to say it or me? I'll let you say it. 
it was fuck you know <laughs> We like we had such a good laugh so like yeah. like literally two hours ago i was on a call with her and and she shows me this and i go like most common words you know do you want to replace any of these words so i can get a little emphatic well it's funny there's a little bit of synchronicity we're talking about this uh andrew and i recorded an episode earlier today and it was the first one i ever swore on really? and your voice was yeah and here's why your voice was in the back of my head because we talked about it before we rolled and you said look I and, and and I'm I'm paraphrasing here, but you said, you know, I I've told myself I'm I'm gonna stop censoring myself. It's inauthentic. This is how I talk. And this is how I'm going to talk. And I think we, we did record it like five years ago. So like it's been in my head that long, that strongly. And so what'd you say? What'd you swear? What was the word? We, um oh I dropped a bunch of F bombs. It's I have I have somebody worse for me, uh, uh, Jenny, who who you are emailing. Yeah, she cannot swear; it will not come out of her mouth. I'll be like in a meeting with her, and I'll go, "Fuck, Jenny, come on!" Like, what is it? And she'll go, "Yeah, well, what did what did the guy read that back?" And she'll go, "He said you can go f yourself." I go, "No, what did he say?" <laughs> he can go. She will not. She has never. I love swear. it. I love I'll, it. So so let me guess. It's a mission now to get her to swear. You're I trying. Try. And, she, I got her smiling about it now and giggling and things, but she will not, she will not say it. Um, you know, I don't know if I told you, if I told you the story in the, in the, in our first talk five years ago, but in the eighties, when I was teaching in Montreal, Canada, we would do these seminars and uh, it was actually at Jerry Beasley's karate college. The first year I taught oh, yeah. um, in the eighties. He came up to me and complained, not complained, but told me that some people had complained that I was swearing at the seminars. And I was like, well, fuck Jerry. You know, <laughs> like, hey, come on, Tony, can you? And I said, okay. Um, but that made me think, like in my next seminar, I said, listen, I swear, uh, not because I've got loose lips and a, like a weak mind, I swear to punctuate that the 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 level i almost want to say like like bone marrow deep is my passion for your personal safety I had a buddy of mine uh, jay ferugia who introduced me at this big big event the sornex summer strong there were 600 people in the audience mm -hmm. and he said he, and it, 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 it gave me goosebumps and almost made me tear up. And because I've spoken at some of his events and we've been friends for years. And uh, he goes, he says, this man cares more about your safety than you do, I promise. Yeah. And, and it's, it's a weird thing. It's, it's like if I was a therapist, I'd be dead already because I, I take every one of my students home with me. I'm like, did I, did I do a good job? But even, even to today, right? 62 years old, uh, been teaching since 1979, professionally since 1980. Uh, I've taught thousands of, I'm still at like a class on Friday going, oh, fuck, I forgot to tell them this. I didn't include that. Like, like, I'm just trying to always squeeze everything in, not knowing what idea is going to make the difference in somebody's competence, confidence, situational awareness or, or or skill but isn't that inevitable because you're not just sitting back and riding on what you did 20 30 40 years ago you're still thinking about stuff and yeah. one of the things that i wanted to make sure we we got into and it, it we don't have to like attack it as a subject but you've been doing what you're doing for long enough that the world has changed and yes. thus i assume while the principles, while the, the absolute root fundamentals may not have changed, some of the implementation implementation likely has. That's a fascinating question and a great observation. And here's a neat thing. Um, ego, power, greed, mm -hmm. uh, abuse, violence. I just wrote, uh, you know, I write three times a week. Yeah. And I, uh, my last newsletter i said hey like it's not that like violence is here to stay violence has always been here right it's always been 
you know, we're hanging out, you know, we're hunters and gatherers. And then we look up and there's like a tribe we don't recognize that has also long pointy sticks and they're wearing dead animal furs. And, and next thing we know, we're fighting for our life because we've got food and they don't, whatever, whatever the reason was. And this goes back a hundred thousand years. There's always been uh, violence. And, um, but what hasn't changed in terms of the, what's the best way to describe this? Like if, if you were going to go into a lab and, and reverse engineer survivability, you would, you would, we put you in the lab, we put me in the lab and we dissolve us. And then we, you know, Earl Meyer flask and I heat you up and I Bunsen burner you and all that. I can't remember. I'm remembering these names from 30 years ago in school. Uh, and I go, Oh, look, this is how this caveman spotted danger intuition. He had a bad feeling. And, and, and then he looked around and used the senses and then, Oh my God, it was a saber tooth tiger or a bear. He ran. Oh, he, then he got an improvised weapon and then he fought and there was a pointy stick, the first spear, right? Yeah. Uh, um, he uses cross extensor reflexes to drive and impale that in there. Uh, somebody grabbed, the hands came up when someone went to hit him with a rock and he stopped that. And then he grabbed the guy's head and smashed him and he's using the cross extensor chain to push away Dean. So if I go back and I, if we had a video of cavemen fighting, we actually have this in, uh, in we have a new, uh, a new iteration of our Be Your Own Bodyguard program. And I found some really amazing old uh, pictures depicting violence and, and mm. fighting. Uh, and, and so our spear stance was his finger splayed, you know, like you know, just the whole, the whole, the way we've reimagined and engineered it. Yeah. But there's, there's like hieroglyphic, you know, uh, pictures of, you know, guys doing this and doing, I'm like, and I'm like, like, see, so like, so yes, to, to answer your question, um, yes, so much has changed, but what hasn't is physiology, kinesiology, psychology, every victim of violence who lived to tell the tale said they had a bad feeling. Well, you know, that's like thousands and thousands of years old. If you could go back and you go, you know, how did you, how did you know, to run right then go like yeah i knew something was wrong in the jungle or in the forest you 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 learn and that's the, what we call the three eyes instincts intuition and intelligence so what i've done whether it's uh somebody sending me messages and channeling or i'm just clever uh uh i believe that i've created it sounds grandiose and obnoxious um a pure behaviorally based self-defense program. Every ingredient in it, you bring to class and you walk the street with. There's no, there's no, listen, in 30 days, if you do this, your legs will move that way and you'll be able to do this move. Um, and there always was with, with uh, you know, I've been in, in multiple mini altercations uh, uh, growing up, you know, I remember a fight I had when I was nine and then one when I was 12 and then one when I was 15 and then a few things, 17, 18, 19. Yeah. And all I remember in, in these violent encounters, uh, you know, and some of them weren't that violent, but the perception of, of, you know, getting junk when you're 12 is extreme violence, even though nothing really happened. But, but what, it, what it, I was aware that I wasn't in control of my cognitive function if i say to you now jeremy what you do you turn around uh then i you take get some money out of the atm you turn around as a guy there with a gun he's going give me your wallet give me your wallet and you go shit he doesn't have a mask on we're kind of in an isolated area his fingers on the trigger but i've done 20 years of gun disarms fuck this guy right like you can have a theoretical answer what you do whether it's to give me your wallet or not but what I've noticed, and, and this is now my first inkling, I call the 80s my incubator period, uh, you know, and it's where I created all the fear management, the de-escalation. And that's an interesting thing, you know, me and my tangents, you know, de-escalation is the biggest thing, and that's the biggest buzzwords in public safety now. Right. Well, 
if you were studying with me in the 80s, you were introduced to nonviolent postures and you were told that everything we do must be morally and ethically and legally sound. And you will always defuse, D-E hyphen F-U-S-E, take the fuse out through choice speech. If you look at Panther Productions' first video from 1986 when it was released, it's called Cerebral Self-Defense, The Mental Edge. So in the 80s, I was going, look, the mind navigates the body. We're not just going to do a move. Uh, I didn't, I, what's, what's really changed to try and answer six of your questions at once <laughs> is, is how I articulate now. Now I've got, like, so in the 80s, I couldn't explain signal speed, myelinization of a neuron, interleaving, brain-based training. None of that nomenclature or language existed because neuroscience hadn't discovered parts of the brain where now like specialists are going, oh, he like, you know, I think last year they discovered a part of your brain where they think courage, the origin for courage is. Uh, so, so you knew the what, but not the why. Um, I knew the why. It's crazy. The why, but not the how. Can, 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 or, or the where. Yeah, there was there was so much going on in the eighties, but I feel like I'm still answering your your question on uh, on you know what what has changed because the world has changed you know it's interesting because you know fear has been completely weaponized and i've been studying and trying to understand fear management since the 80s since the 60s and 70s more for myself i never really talked about it and i i was it was interesting as two weeks ago i realized i never told my mother or father that i was afraid of anything when when i was in fact often very afraid of certain things was that I behavior know. they modeled or was that just i think i think that's work? i think that's cultural well i think that's that's um well part of how I, I i was wired but i don't think even today people talk about fear people mm. rationalize you know the play on words rational hyphen lies hey why didn't you do that oh no nah, i didn't call her up because i knew no 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 hey why didn't you defend yourself there Ah, oh, what's the point? That, and I'm not saying that everyone should fight, but a lot of times what we're doing is we're listening to our the conversation of fear in our mind and then selecting the path of least resistance or strategy. And, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting introspection when, when you can separate the two and then say, I'm scared to do this and then figure out, okay, I got to do this anyhow, because that's the only way you're going to self-actualize, become a better version of yourself if, is if you manage fear. And that's be, been become uh, like a, uh, my primary mission right now is, is growing the no fear program, K-N-O-W, um, and, and helping people understand it. Because the truth of the matter is every single martial artist has a theoretical explanation for what they do in any situation but when you look at cctv or smartphone footage or a body cam on a cop or any type of footage of violence we never see ever with the exception of a very specific um situations which we can get into if you want but 99 percent of the time you don't see anything that's practiced in the dojo or in the studio or in school and and i was it's like for me i was like why why is that and then when i would have my altercations i go okay i'm a really good boxer i'm really good at taekwondo i love bruce lee i'm messing around with wing chun and jeet kune do and all that and this happened and i got scared my heart started to race tunnel vision here and then when we fought i don't even remember what happened but i don't think i did you know bong sao i don't think i straight blast i don't think i did a sidekick i don't it was more you know, like a, like a hockey fight, just fucking, you know, like you're just sloppy, right? Sloppy, wild. But, uh, you know, it's funny. I wrote an email to my, uh, to my team, our affiliates. Um, we had an instructor program last week and I always, I always go on and talk on them. And, um, and I did this rant. It was just, it was, it was a wonderful rant. And I knew I wanted to share it with all the affiliates around the world. And I said, hey, here's a message from your fear hyphen less and fear hyphen full leader with a little smiley face. 
reminding people that here I am, like this guy, like like I do, I do talks at like major companies, tier one military, all on managing fear and creating scenario. So there's this assumption that I'm like beyond fear yeah. for some people. And I reminded people, like literally it's like two days old. Hey, please watch this message from your fearless, fearful leader with the hyphens. Yeah. So that look at that and go, what the fuck is he talking about? What, like, because I'm always trying to instill an opportunity to go deeper in yourself. What is he? Why would Tony say he's fearful right now, full of fear? And also in the same sentence, be inside each other, say fear less, fearful. And then, you know, I went on Facebook Live on the team a few days later and I said, hey, let's talk about that, right? Because that's, to me, you know, if you think back at some of the, 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 let's say, origin statements of why we train martial arts, it's not for self-defense at some point. It's transcendence. It's self-actualization. It's, it's you know... And, uh, you know, out of one's true self emerges or one's true self emerges out of other practice and all that. I don't know if that was from Koshi or, or Kano or there was some quote I just found. It's up. familiar. I can't place it. Right. And um, so that, that stuff, that stuff occupies my mind more than, you know, uh, could I hit this guy with, a, you know, an eye gouge and hope he never watched the Three Stooges and he knows the <laughs> Fuck them. Oh shit, right? Yeah. You know. Anyways. Fear fear is so so interesting. And you know, I could probably pull a lot of examples, but the one that's coming to mind, you know that scene in I think it's the first Christian Bale Batman where he falls into the well and the bats. Right. And then and he's terrified as a kid, then he goes back later and he's just kind of embraced it. It's it's not that he's no longer afraid. It's that he's willing to face that and and use it and have an I would imagine an understanding of it. Yeah. And we can look at that in in other ways. It's not just fear, but all of the the scariest things. You know, you if you ever well, you have far more contact with law enforcement than I do. But when I listen to accounts of people, especially guys that go undercover you know, they're riding a very fine line and they're watching a part of themselves shift because they have to embrace that so they can do what they're doing. Yeah. And, you know, I, there there are deep, dark places in all of us and sometimes we've got to, we've got to tap them. Yeah, no, it's a, that's an interesting observation. observation. And, uh, you know, there's a, a fancy term in, in law enforcement scenario training called stress inoculation mm. and you expose yourself to the stress and your body creates an adaptation for that uh i'm friends with a lot of uh retired special operations guys um you know i've worked with a lot of them when they were in still friends with them uh on v 11 i was at fort bragg mm. you know working with a lot of these guys and there's this when you first meet them, there's this there's this assumption of uh, well, not just the courage and the power and the strength, but there's an assumption that we make going that they're fearless, and the coolest guys will tell you we're scared shitless, mm -hmm. but this is our job and we're trained. In other words, the idea of the penalty if this doesn't go well isn't lost on them but they still go let's go and they've got their own pre-fight ritual a lot of people don't realize you know uh hate him or love him that you know tyson was an incredibly formidable boxer sure. uh you know he's you know regularly telling people how scared he was and how he used fear and customato his coach you know, was very famous for for some maxims on fear that the difference between the hero and the coward is what they do with their fear. They both feel it. That you know, fear is like fire. It can it can heat your food and warm you, or it can burn your house down. It depends on your relationship with it. And so, 
uh, all of those things really are are kind of you know nods or or confirmations that this this intuition I had back in the eighties that this is way more important than we realize. It's 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 the still to this day the single greatest overlooked area of of you know developing uh personal skill competence and confidence it's yeah. it's fear in in anything and you can i can so i do things now with like like uh, i think i alluded to it earlier um i have a guy who who started training with with us as a self from a self defense perspective big big guy former marine mm-hmm. but he's retired now and he's he's working in uh the private sector and uh in a billion dollar industry and he just got promoted and the expectations is your sales this year are going to be this many million and your team is 12 and and he's thrust into that and here's a guy that you know you know went to battle understood the risk on the battlefield called me up and said i am fucking so scared like of this challenge in front of me yeah. and and ask me if my no fear could help him blah 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 so, so we're doing you know and it's neat it's 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 and i and i tell people this i mean you you know you've been on my website and we've talked before you know we've got gunfighting courses and multiple sailing courses and and you know uh, weapon protection courses and probably about 16 different programs that we run and uh it uh if you said what's the most important course you do it'd be my mindset now the fear management because and this is something that i that i discovered and observed in the 80s when i created that panic attack uh, uh force on force that was like fight club before fight club was a movie and um I realized that the people who managed their fear always managed to fight. And the people who didn't manage their fear didn't fight, yeah. didn't fight back, didn't fully engage, didn't try so hard because they were preoccupied with the, the movie in their mind, right? So, so I use the acronym false expectations appearing real to describe probably the, the most uh, potent and debilitating part of psychological fear. And, and some of the stuff we're doing, and I'll tell you, man, it's so cool when, uh, you know, I've had talks with neuroscientists and people like that, and they're like, like listening to me, like, hmm, and then have never thought about it that way, like to, to kind of get them to lean in, because they're yeah. all nerds, like I'm in awe of them, you did this, you, you opened up a brain and looked in here and did, where, like, my insights were from studying victims of violence and victors of violence and then intuitively mapping you know where there was an overlap yeah and it was always things like it was like no one ever said well thank god i was like a fourth dan in this because like no like when you interview people you know well i lost that fight because uh you know i hadn't promoted to blue belt and i was just like it was if you get them to to emote honestly it was always about fear. Yeah. It was always there, about there's a drill that that I run sometimes when I when I travel and I teach. And I didn't make this up. I, and I don't know where it came from. I learned it from my instructors when I was, you know, in the early mid 80s when I was real young. And it's very simple. And what I love about it is that it so beautifully illustrates what you're talking about because there's so little risk. So what you do. You take the class, and I've talked about this on the show a couple times over the years. Take the class, make two lines. Everybody's just standing there. You pull one person. They come to the head. You turn them around, and you go through, and you pick roughly half of the people. You're all attackers. They get one single, moderately paced, low-risk attack. Three-quarters of people lose it. I've watched people who've been training 20, 30 years. You turn them around and they go to step in and they just can't function. And I use that as an illustration of what you were talking about. It's not about the technique. It's not about the blocks. It's about, can you actually get yourself to function in that environment? And if the answer is no, there's something to work on. The, yeah, the, there's, there's a maxim that I heard a long, long time ago. Um, 
was just a sentence. The mind navigates the body. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of people that think there's muscle memory and muscle muscles don't have the, the uh, capacity to store memory, but there's a part of your brain uh, uh, that produces like a motor engram, which is like, like a, a, let's say a memory circuit of how something's supposed to fire. Mm. So, you know, let, let's say you stop playing golf for 10 years and then you pick up a club and you go, oh man, come on, I guess I still got it. You know, people go, that's muscle memory. It was actually a neural pattern that you would You were develop. talking about myelin sheath and the yeah. thickening of that earlier, right? Yeah. You know, what's interesting is a buddy of mine, Tom Campbell, uh, also 62, lifelong martial artist. Um, uh, we, he, we were talking, catching up Sunday and he said, hey, he says, how many jabs do you think you've thrown in your life? And I like jabs at people or like, like physical jab, like, you know, we're joking around. And uh, he goes, he says, I've been, you know, boxing since I'm like seven years old, him. And I said, I just rounded it off because there are some days that I was in the gym all day, right? Just, well, just working out. But let's say I did a hundred jabs a day. This is maybe less, maybe more. And I don't want to screw the math up here because this is this is a fantastic thing. We're talking about myelin sheet and signal speed and and uh, neural patterns. So he's 62. So if he does uh, 100 jabs a day times 365 days is 36,000 in one year mm -hmm. times 50 years. 1.825 yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah close to 2 million yeah imagine it's a lot of repetition well this is the thing that i and, and i actually uh, turned that into a whole class on monday mm -hmm. where uh, i i i saw chael son and uh, do a talk and i seen jocko do this talking about the difference between motivation and discipline yep. and you know it's easy just as a refresher for anybody that's not current or familiar with it when you're motivated you, nobody needs to say hey do you want to go do this because you're motivated the trick is when you don't want to do it, but you've committed to it or you know you're supposed to, that's discipline. And so, you know, it's great to be motivated, but then it's like Sunday, you don't want to work out, but you know it's not your rest day, or you said, you said yesterday, I'm going to go for a run, or I'm going to hit the weights, or I'm going to hit the bag. And then you go do it. That's discipline. And the people that really, I think, get the best out of life are the ones that are disciplined. They, they make shit happen. Yeah. Uh, and, and, um, I, I tie this in, into this, and you know my 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 maxim: be careful what you practice. You might get really good at the wrong thing. And a lot of people misunderstood that as me putting down their style, but it was it was my initial intuition about neural patterns. Because what I would say in the eighties, I'd go, "Look, you're a wrestler, you're a boxer, you're a Wing Chun guy." And you came to my fight club experience. We didn't call it fight club. We called it a panic attack. And we would do these force on force scenarios. And nobody looked like how they warmed up. Nobody looked like the martial art they practice. Very similar to your drill of walking down there. And just the, 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 uh, uh, the fear buildup, the pressure. And this is, you know, I went off down one of my rare tangents. But there's, there's two um places i'm trying to think of the, the best way to describe this there's two types of fear that we can discuss and most of the people talk about fight flight freeze uh and and tonic immobility and all these fancy terms are referring to the physiological fear response when danger is close what they're not talking about, which is more significant, is the psychological fear. Because I always make this joke that, you know, you're out, you're out in the woods or the desert, or you go playing golf in the south, and you hit your, I'm not a golfer, but I always use this, this analogy. I hit the ball into the woods, and uh, I'm looking for my ball. And as I reach down, I hear like a rattle sound. My brain, for a moment, doesn't think it's a small tambourine band immediately i think it's a rattlesnake your body always errs on the side of survival well that fear response whatever it was freeze run scream uh would be based on survival survival instincts mm -hmm. 
But immediately what's triggered is a psychological fear of what happens if I get bit. And so false expectations appear in real. The way I define it is I'm visualizing a future event that hasn't happened and it's immobilizing me in the present. And it's very subtle. So I now, I now, and this has happened to me where I go to grab something and there's a, a branch in the grass and my brain thinks it's a snake and I go, fuck. And then I see that it's a stick, but I've already, my, the fear response, the arousal, the heart rate has changed, the, the you know, physiology is starting to change. So what, what happens is there's, there's two, we're impacted on two levels by the, and by the perception of a threat. One is instinctive, that hits our physiology, and, our, and then that, that sends messages through our brain and our body that'll produce the flinch, that'll change your breathing, that you'll hold your breath or you go to hyperventilating or use palms, sweaty palms, butterflies. But then almost immediately, a psychological fear response happens. And that's the movie in your mind that is depicting like your demise. This is going to not, this is not going to turn out well. And this is why I say this is the, 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 the most fascinating area for me because when we improve our self-awareness to catch that, we change what happens next in the next minute of our life. And so I love this connection that, that you know, fear management, when you, when you understand the formula and its essence, is actually time management because when you're in the fear loop, you're consuming time. If I say to you, Jeremy, why haven't you turned in this report? Why didn't you finish this book? Why didn't you punch that guy in the face? What were you, what are you waiting for? You know, I got, uh, uh, you know, how many times, How you know, I don't know if you still do this, but remember when jump back kicks and back kicks and spinning hook kicks? Yeah, they're fun. Thing, right? Uh, do you still do them? Can you do them? I can't move sure. like that. Right? Yeah. Bastard. Lucky. Um, it's because you stopped doing them. You keep doing them. You can keep doing them much the um uh but you think about sparring like everyone is doing their back kick in the air and then they're doing their back kick on bob or on a bag and when you're standing in front of a bag and you tell yourself you're going to do 10 back kicks jump back kick spinning quick you do them but when you go spar you can't do 10 something happens when there's somebody else there and what and this is this is the onion that i help people mm. deconstruct that guy's clearly open for a back kick when he does that why didn't you throw it and the answer if you peel the onion is i didn't think i was going to pull it off what do you mean i was what they'll eventually say if if they can lean into being vulnerable and transparent is i was afraid i was going to get a reverse punch in the back of the head I was afraid I was going to get countered. I was afraid I'd lose the match by doing something so risky. It all so the fear spike, and this is this is such an important thing for for I believe everybody in your audience is most type A males in particularly don't like the word fear because there's a part of us that that assumes part of that definition means I'm unwarrior like mm -hmm. or i'm a cowardly or i'm where uh the the idea of survival and surviving from maslow's hierarchy of needs the bottom tier like if you're and i could think of like like a bunch of military guys where i said hey man were you afraid in battle because because uh, there's a lot of people that I train that have done stuff that I'll never do. And I recognize that. And I'm in awe that they trust me to come in and train them. So I ask them very probing questions because there's a number of people that respect my opinion enough to ask me questions. I want to be able to not just be sure about my idea, but also to have vetted this from other people that have done like 10x what I'm hypothesizing about. And these guys, they'll go, listen, 
you know, one of my buddies, Mike Ritland, he's a, a former SEAL. He goes, man, he says, I can remember so many times we were stacked outside the house and we knew every single person in that house was a bad guy and they were going to try and kill us. And anyone who tells you they weren't scared is just full of shit. Mm -hmm. We were scared, but we knew why we were fighting and we knew what we we're supposed to do. And if you talk to, you know, like George St. Pierre will say, hey, the, the worst day of my, di my, my life is every day I have to fight. He just say, I'm so scared before I go. But if you saw a picture of him like jumping across the ring doing a Superman punch, like ripped, you know, like like laying into BJ or Matt Sarah or whatever, Matt Sarah knocked him out. But he makes a joke about that. He says, the only time I wasn't afraid in a fight was when I fought Sarah. <laughs> and then he jokes, he goes, maybe I should have been afraid. But you, you've used a word a couple of times and it's a word that we keep coming back to in so many conversations on so many subjects. And that is why. All the examples you're giving, fear exists, but the why is stronger. The, the why are we afraid or why do we? No, the, the why, the reason for the scenario. You know, GSP's in the ring and, and he's afraid of his opponent, but that's his job. That's his mission. That's, that's his purpose in life. And that is stronger than the fear. Because if it wasn't, he wouldn't be there. The fear would win. And this is an interesting thing. Did I ever tell you in the in the uh, in the in our first talk? Did I ever talk to you when I interviewed uh, Maurice Smith about oh, fear? Doesn't, doesn't ring a bell. So I'm I'm at a, a a seminar that I'm teaching at, and uh, Maurice is there. And I'm like I said, anytime I anytime I meet somebody, if someone said that woman was almost murdered, that woman was raped, or that mm -hmm. guy was jumped. If if it's appropriate, I'll, I'll try to pick their brain, you know, and try to, and I've also found that it's a little cathartic for people. If you're talking to somebody who, who can understand and, and help them through some stuff. Um, but I was talking to Maurice and I said, Maurice, I like, I always like to talk to fighters about fear and, uh, or, you know, what's your pre-fight ritual? What's, how do you manage fear before a fight? And, uh, he goes, let me ask you a question. And I'm like, okay, I thought I was interviewing you, but okay, go ahead. And he says, uh, do you have a job? And I said, yeah, I do. He said, are you afraid to go to work? I said, no. He said, me either. And I was like, fuck, like what a cool line for a movie. But so most of the people I train now are coaches and trainers and instructors. And I share with them this story because it's very easy. That's like... That's a unicorn answer. That's not for most of the world. And it'd be very easy. And this is what you see with a lot of self-help or protocols, or even in, in, in systems and styles. This is what we do when this happens. It's not, uh, I saw this uh, interesting article by, um, um, oh fuck, I just forgot his name. Um, oh shit, Tucker. Who's the author, Tucker? Um, Oh, you know his name. If I, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta look it okay. up. Okay, uh, it's the beauty of cell phones, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, no, we we're just, we we're just um, um, hitting each up on uh, Tim Larkin mentioned me in a thread, and it was here we go. Oh, I can't believe I forgot his last name because he wrote. He's a pretty famous author now. He wrote a really interesting book back in the day and now he's got a, a publishing company uh tucker max can't believe how do you forget the the last name mm. uh, max but he's uh he just uh, he's a very provocative author but he just wrote a uh um an art a blog and a video and he and it's like my complete self-defense system and he goes on to explain how he created his own self-defense system and it's a provocative title because you're like what the fuck what do you mean you created but, you know, he trained with this military guy and he trained with Tim Larkin and he took and he trained with Tim Kennedy and he and he's got guns and he shoots and he goes to jujitsu and all of that. But the essence of it was that only he knows what he needs to protect himself and his family. And, his house. and uh, it, it, it resonated with my very first article in Black Belt magazine in 1980. 
where I said that I believe that there should be as many self-defense systems as there are people practicing self-defense. This is in 1980. And, That's and why they didn't like you. It's it's, <laughs> it's it's at least part of it. No, but you're serious. Like, you know. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's, it's uh, uh, you're not so, the only one on this set on, on this podcast that, that, that gets hate. Okay. You, you probably get less of it than you used to. Come on. I thought it was me. I'm trying to monitor. Oh, you my... get, you get more. You definitely yeah. get more because more people know who you are. The uh, it's, it's funny, but the, um, the, uh, the idea there was, and it, it actually comes back. It's full. It comes back full circle to, well, what the hell's the spear system? And, and if that's true, isn't that a contradiction that I'm teaching a system if I also believe? No, because the, the I started to say earlier, if, if we went into a lab and reverse engineer survivability, we would have to look at physiology. We'd have to look at instincts and intuition. We'd have to look at kinesiology and natural biomechanics. And we'd have to look at psychology. And if you looked at the you know, ingredients, you know, on the side of, you know, the, 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 the bottle of spear, it would say all organic and it would say physiology, kinesiology, psychology, mm -hmm. and everything we teach, even the way we throw an elbow, the way we rake, the way we do a palm strike, the origin impulse is from a, 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 uh, the cross extensor reflex from mm -hmm. a physiological impulse the hypothesis is that our situational awareness has been compromised. When your situational awareness is compromised, if there's truly danger close and imminent has become immediate and your situational awareness, you're, because situational awareness is a conscious cognitive skill. I'm here looking at you. I'm totally focused here. If a spider dropped down on a spider web here, and it was just hanging here. And I'm like looking at you and, and then you see it before I do. And you go, uh, Tom, yeah, on your right shoulder. And I, uh, I'd, I'd be like this, where if I see it near you or if I see it on the wall, like, ah, oh, fuck, there's a spider. That's pretty nasty, right? So if we've got time and space, we can self-regulate. We can right. change. Our state. Um, so it's when a stimulus is introduced too quickly that our physiological system uh, grabs the steering wheel hmm. metaphor and this is this is this this big connection and this is like delving into the fear spike that triggers the startle flinch which is to get small cover the head move away from danger and if there's time and space push away and that's where finger splayed outside 90 came from where what you're doing is you're weaponizing your startle flinch because in essence your startle flinch is a biological airbag and it's way cooler than the mechanical airbag in the car because the airbag in the car needs the car to be struck for it to deploy and airbags save lives you know that right if mm -hmm. we we closed off all airbags for 24 hours fatalities in road in car accidents would go up yep. so airbags save lives but consider this metaphor the car needs to be in a collision for the airbag to deploy where if i if if we were closer and it wasn't zoom and i went what did you say and i stood up you'd go without me hitting you, whoa, dude, calm down. And you would start to deploy the biological airbag. If you don't have any understanding of how this operates, how this works, how to turn this into something uh, um, that is protective by design and nature and can be tactical, because that's why I said, like the way we teach a palm strike, it's not like, okay, this is your palm, get your hand up here, drive it out. It's it the, the 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 nerve and the nervous system and and all of the the um survival reflexes of pushing away danger form the first ignition for the palm strike and then what we do is we in training we go micro flinch push away danger and then from there we will drive out and put it out now we practice a cognitive control of that but every class will remind it that the nucleus of this complex motor skill is a primal gross motor skill that you don't even have to think about so if i whip something through you know the, the screen to you and your hands came up and i love asking this like you flinched ten thousand times in your life and it's always perfect 
right? Nobody, nobody goes to flinch school, right? right? Someone goes, look out, you do this. You're at the golf course. There's golf again. I don't play golf. Someone goes, look out for, you know, we, we duck. Um, you know, you're getting something out of the closet and, and you pull something and a shoebox falls and your hands, your hands go up. You don't hit the horse stance. You're not punching it. Right. You, know, you're, you move. And so there's a lot cooler things to do than flinch. We always look, <laughs> we look like awful athletes when we flinch. Like nobody wants to be on the cover of, you know, whistle kick or black belt times going, you know. <laughs> but that's a great idea for a magazine. Right? <laughs> <laughs> People, martial artists at their worst, they're all, they're all right. like this. Right. Kick uh, who, who wore it worst? <laughs> uh, um, but the idea here is nobody in the world thinks to flinch, but flinching is a survival reflex when your conscious cognitive situational awareness has been compromised. So we built this whole system around this idea that all fights are dangerous, but the most dangerous fight is the ambush. The ambush it will 99.9% of the time hijack executive function for a brief time. Executive function is hijacked. You don't have uh, uh, any lucid access to your cognitive brain. Your cognitive brain is where we keep all of our, our motor engram connections to all the stuff we did. So if I say to you, guys coming at you with... Uh, uh, a number one angle with a Cali stick, you'd go, well, I would just rise up here and block him. Like we have all the patterns that we practiced, but when we're surprised, we don't have access to that immediately. We need to recalibrate is the term I use. We need to recalibrate and it might be an emotional or a psychological or a physical recalibration or all of the above. And so, you know, for, for 30 years now, I've been developing drills around this hypothesis that and this is, this is the whole thing we start off, uh, you know, the, the talk with me making fun of myself being the romantic poet, where I go, yes, your boxing is great. Yes, your Krav is great. Yes, your Jiu Jitsu is great. Yes, your Taekwondo is great. Yes, your Thai is great. But if you're standing in line at Starbucks going, oh, what should I have? And I'm like, God, man, how does he not know what he wants? He's been in line for 10 minutes. He should have, now he's reading the menu and he just got up to the front. It's a joke, right? Because people do that. You're in line. Mm -hmm. I can help you. Mm. You don't know yet? You've been in line for 10 minutes. Uh, just, just kidding. But if, if you're in line at Starbucks or waiting to get a burger or sitting down to dinner or filling up your car with gas and something just erupts, you're not your style. You're the human being going, what the fuck is going on? Right. Holy shit. And unless you're highly trained, and there are some people that are highly trained for those situations, but in, in some cases are the unicorns, like the Maurice Smith answer. And in some cases, they're like, the, you know, the, the guy's been military law enforcement for, for decades. But even then, there's a video, I did this, uh, you know, the company Caliber Press, they're, no, they're so. a big, big law enforcement uh, education company out of Chicago, probably one of the biggest in the world. So I've written a bunch of articles for them, and, and I, was, I was the first guest on their podcast. Oh, cool. And on it, um, we had CCT video of three Israeli soldiers walk up to a guy uh, and ask him for his papers. Mm. He goes like this. Let me see if I can replicate this here. He pulls out. Hang on a second. He he stands. He 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 stands. He stands up from a bench, and he goes like this. He goes, "Yeah, hold on now. Let me get my papers." And as he pulls his papers out, he comes out with a knife and slashes. I've seen this clip. Yeah, slashes one of the guys in like into the subclavian, like just like Adam. And it's three Israeli soldiers with, with long guns and kit on and helmet. And then he slashed another guy. And, and the guys go here, like the guy's standing here like this. And this guy goes, whoa, like he's back here. He slashed at another guy. And this guy's like, whoa. And he's moving backwards like that. And then he's running. And then I think five or six other soldiers come running in and freaking light him up. And he dies of lead poisoning. And I asked the question, not trying to be a dick. I go, where was their Krav Maga? Right. Like it's a reasonable question. You know, it's we, exactly the type of scenario that they theoretically, well, not theoretically, the type of scenario they 
are training for, have been trained for. And nowhere would it have been more authentic, Krav, than here's a guy in the Israeli army. And, and this is where, and this is the, the poet in me going, I'm just trying to make you safer. And I, would, I, I, had, a, I had a tagline uh, that I would say, I would always uh, end my interviews with, don't hate me, hate the bad guy. Mm. If, if there was no violence, you and I wouldn't be teaching self-defense. Right. And I'd be okay with that. I know that I'd figure out something else to do. That's how much I abhor violence. I abhor it so much. It scares me so much. That's why I practice it. And that's why I teach it. Because when I hear of violence or I see violence, I'm not looking at they should have done this, they should have done that. I immediately, this is so true, man. I get so sad because I immediately think of the fear of the victim. What were they thinking there? Mm. What were they wishing? Somebody please help me. What? you know and and so this is where i know like the most important thing that we could do as martial artists teaching self-defense is is to lean into fear management because it is the single most potent and powerful energy you can have i wrote this in 1985 for inside karate magazine uh i wrote there are more people who get attacked every day and successfully defend themselves than there ever will be trained people who get attacked and successfully defend themselves. Like every three seconds, something's happening somewhere. I don't know what the numbers are now. Three seconds, six seconds, someone's getting attacked. And we don't hear about all the attacks because if you fight back and the person runs away, you don't run to the police office and go, hey man, I didn't get a good look at the guy, but I smacked him in the head and he took off. Okay, thanks, right? Like, And it's only one in 10 you know, you know, crimes, let's say like uh, sexual assaults that are reported. Yep. But it, it, it's, it's an interesting thing. It's the power of the mind navigates the body. Now, what if we're teaching intelligent fear management? Not, not, I don't, I don't mean to make fun of other systems, but it's a okay. lot of, a lot of the, I don't mean martial arts system, but like performance systems. There's a lot of performance systems out there that are deep into okay visualize get in the happy space you know remember happy gilmore yep. go to your happy place da, 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 da. and i and i would say like you don't have time to do that in a fight you can't namaste your way out of a violent no. um there, there's no time there's no time for pre-fight rituals or exactly exactly anything. that's one of the things uh, stretching Gretchen, yeah this it's one of the things that uh um people would ask me i remember i was working with this one military group they had tons of discretionary funds and so they could train with anybody. I mean, they were like literally this group when Evil Knievel was around, like hired him to come in and teach them motorcycle works. So they had brought me in and they asked me, they sent me some video of a guy uh, doing um, uh, uh, some demos of resilience, like being able to take full on punches to the throat, like kicks to the groin. And they were, they were asking like, what do you think of this? Is this bullshit? And so here's a guy like inviting people out of a crowd and he's punching them and getting punched in the throat. You've seen those types of demos, kicks the nuts. And I said, listen, what the body can do is amazing. The resilience we have, uh, it's amazing what the body can do. However, and I'm glad you asked, and listen, you guys have discretionary funds, train with the guy. But here are the questions. How long did it take to learn? How long does it take to activate? In other words, if he needs to do two deep breaths before the kick to the balls, that has zero application for you in an ambush. If, if he needs one second to get ready, that has zero application for you in an ambush. Because these guys, these guys were like high level operators, right? I'm going, if he needs to know the attack is coming to get ready, that has zero application for you in an ambush, right? You tracking? Yeah. It's like, so if I need to know, okay, hold on a second, okay, I'm ready. Like, even if you could do it really quick, you need to know. I mean, do you, do you know how Houdini died? Harry Houdini? Do you know the story? He, he drowned, right? No. Oh. I, thought, I thought he was in a box and wrapped up and didn't, couldn't get to his key or something like that. Um, one of his demos, this is my understanding. You may be right, but this is my understanding. One of his demos was, uh, uh, you know, aside from 
getting out of chains and doing all the Houdini stuff that he's known for is he would let anyone from the audience punch him in a body. Oh, that's right. I did. And I he wasn't heard this. One night. He didn't know this, but he, he had a, uh, an appendix appendix that needed to come out. Mm. And, uh, um, some guy wanted to do the demo or had done it. And he said, I'm not feeling good. And, uh, he waved the guy off and the guy was either drunk or angry, follow, followed him. And when Houdini turned, he hook punched him and he ruptured his appendix and he mm. died. From that. That's what I heard. No, uh, now that you say that, that sounds familiar. So we should, uh, we should fact check. How did Harry Houdini die? Harry Houdini's causes of death were appendicitis and peritonitis. And it was ruptured by a strike. Now, what's the point of bringing that up? How does, how does this fit in here? Is because when Houdini was ready, he could protect himself. And when he turned his back and said, I'm not feeling good because he had appendicitis and he got hit, it, it ruptured. So, you know, it's, 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 uh, if you've ever had a flash knockout, I've, I've been, I've been dropped a couple of times by really good boxers where, you know, I'm over here. The next thing I, I remember in Gleason's gym sparring this guy. And I was in the middle of the ring and we exchanged something and, and he, he was, you know, I, I was a good boxer, but this guy was a pro boxer and there's a big difference. And um, I always make the joke that like several seconds of my life is missing in, in Brooklyn, in Gleason's gym. And I just came to in a clinch against the, the rope. Mm. I was like swinging up, trying to, trying to get a body shot. And I'm like, what the fuck just happened there? Mm. Right. Um, it's it's the shot you don't see that'll drop you and the shot you don't see that'll 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 hit you uh but anyways and, yeah. and the other stuff you know i, I want to make sure that that because i know i suspect we're on the same page the other stuff is is interesting it's valuable you know preparing and walking over hot coals or anything like that like there there is carryover you know it does make you more resilient but it doesn't mean that you necessarily and certainly you're advising against build your self-defense protocols around that sort of stuff, because why not use the stuff you've already got? Yeah. The, listen, I'm, I think because I'm so passionate about what I do, people forget that I'm a lifelong martial artist and, mm -hmm. and I love martial arts and I still, I was making fun of back kicks and stuff like that, but I fuck around with them every so often. And, yeah. But I'm, you know, for for 30 years, I've been so singularly focused on training the good guys for real fights. My focus went, went, went all there. But, you know, I've got guns and I got knives and I got sticks and I got a martial artist. Because it became um, my canvas and how I fed my family and grew my company, you know, it's okay, seven days a week for the last, you know, uh, 30 years, just focus on that. And uh, it's you made you made the joke, but you were serious, you stopped doing it, you're gonna lose it, right. And uh, the, you know, I make a joke now, I could kick you in the head, Jeremy, lie down. <laughs> right? Oh, you want me to do it while you're standing? That's a problem. Um, Bill Wallace does a, a very similar joke, by the way. Does he? Yeah. And, uh, but Bill could probably still kick us in the head. He can, but he, but he, he's like, oh, if I kick in, kick in the knee, then I can kick in the head. Doesn't matter how tall you are, right? Um, yeah, the uh, uh, he just made me think of a time that Wallace and Joe Lewis were. Was it? Was it Bill? Might have been. Uh, oh fuck! It was Joe Lewis and I think Wallace. They were up in Montreal, and we were. They were in my car, and and my. Uh, my engine died and we didn't have phones i'm driving they didn't know where they, and i had joe lewis pushing my jeep but imagine if i had smartphones are going hurry up back there and i'm filming this <laughs> shit. It, was, it was uh it was crazy crazy the, uh, you you might be one of very few people who can say, say that they had those two pushing a car yeah uh Trump. it uh it, it's some crazy times some crazy times absolutely the um well you're just asking me we went off on a crazy tangent there oh, oh it's fine but, um, the hallmark um, of the show yeah but the the, the it, it was that i i'm so 
passionate about this stuff. I think that people listen and they go, you know, he hates all other martial arts except for what he does. He thinks his stuff is the most important stuff. And what I'm, what I'm talking about is like truly, if you understand how to weaponize the start of Lynch, which you will do anyhow, if you're caught off guard, if you understand more about fear management, if you look at, you know, if you just step back and went, why would governments around the world hire Blauer and his team to come in and, and train their trainers on scenario design? And if, and if you looked at that and you went, is there anything I can learn from this company or from this system? Because that would just make you safer. And that would, and, and, and if you're safer, your family's safer. And if you're an instructor, your students are safer. Why wouldn't you want to research? Right. And- I, I've never seen what you do as an either or. I've always seen what you do as another layer another insight, a lens, a perspective that's greatly informed my training. I mean, one of the things that I'm I'm traveling, doing a lot of training with others now, I'm breaking people down to hyper slow so their brain can catch up and showing them a lot of things that are, I mean, it's it's a completely different way of getting there, but it's very similar to some of the things that you're doing. It doesn't mean that that's all I do or want to do or think people should do all that all this stuff's good I still love doing forms but this perspective I think helps people get with their get where they're trying to go yeah and that's valuable and and as you said why wouldn't you explore it yeah good and I love that another layer And, and I love the you know and, and maybe I got a, I got a, I was telling this story um, on a podcast last week. Uh, in 1993, I was teaching at ASLET, American Society of Law Enforcement Trainers, mm-hmm. not around anymore, but it's like, I mean, hundreds of trainers from all over the world. And it was my first ever, I'd been invited uh, by Gary Klugowitz, who was the red man rep. Uh, but he was also the chairman of ASLET and he was a big deal in, in law enforcement. And uh, we had had this five hour talk one night at a high liability conference. And he said, hey, man, I don't know if I agree with everything that you say, but I'm really fascinated and I'd be doing my community a disservice by not putting you in front and letting them contemplate this stuff, weigh and consider. And so he invited me to... Uh, to it was Dallas 93 and I'm talking to this group and there's cops in there like sitting there like this sneering at me arms crossed at a break don't come back from the break really offended by and I was like and this is one of the things um you know we talked about like hey times have changed well you know uh ego and fear haven't changed and it was like why why would anything I say be that disruptive to you that you would not come back to the class to listen or take notes or then go back and experiment and go, you know, is this true? Is this bullshit? And one of the things I, I told guys, you know, the term reactionary gap. Mm-hmm. Where, so for, for people who aren't familiar with the term, that's the, the, the distance between a police officer and a suspect. It's referred to as this reactionary gap. And usually they assign a six foot distance called the reactionary gap so it's 1993 and i say how many of you have heard of the reactionary gap well they all look around going fuck does he know his audience we're all cops yeah of course i go how many of you believe in the term the reactionary gap and the reactionary gap is the distance between you and the suspect and therefore the implication or the 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 implied essence of reactionary gap it's the gap with which you have to react this is when i gotta make shit happen they're like yeah and then I said, how many of you have heard of Dennis Tuller and what is commonly referred to as the Tuller drill? Have you ever heard of it, Jeremy? In law? I don't think so. So Tuller, if anyone wants to look it up, it's T-U-E-L-L-E-R. So Dennis Tuller did this drill where he discovered if you took two average athletes and one had a knife and one had a gun and the gun was in the holster that you needed 21 feet distance i didn't so, know it by name but yes so you've heard it as the 21 foot rule or yeah. 21 foot drill. 
So the 21 foot drill, it's famous in law enforcement, completely misunderstood, but famous, right? And it's like another reason, like, you know, how I, how I produce so many haters so quickly is because a lot of people are selective listeners and I, and I'll say tooler misunderstood. There's no such thing. And they'll go, well, because like, if you teach that it's part of your curriculum, or maybe it's something you hang your hat on in a demo, it's like, fuck, what did he say? As opposed to wait a minute. If there's any truth to what this idiot is saying, I need to know that because my students really fight, you know? And so what I explained to people, I said this, and you know the drill, so I'll do it with you. In, in Tuller's research, he discovered that if I have a knife way back here, if I've got a knife here and I produce it and come running at you, that I close in 1.5 seconds, approximately 1.5 seconds. And that was the gap time, the refractory delay between stimulus response for somebody to go threat, draw their weapon, step offline and engage. And it was approximately 21 feet all the time. I don't know how that's possible, but it was. Now, follow this because I, I, I find this fascinating. I love doing this talk, even though this isn't a law enforcement show. Uh, it's, it's, it's an important discussion about how myths and legends and misunderstandings happen. Let's say it's 21 feet. So my question was, if I needed 21 feet to come at you and stab you with a knife, I would ask the people, I'd say, what distance is safe for you to draw your gun and shoot me if I don't have a knife? And all of these cops, and one of the talks I did, there were 400 trainers in the, in the assembly hall. I go, what distance do you need if I don't have a knife? And they're like, what? Nobody had an answer. I said, if I can run and stab you at 21 feet with a knife, can't I punch you in the face and stun you and steal your gun from 21 feet less the length of the knife because if i can if i can run at you and go slash at 21 feet aren't the biomechanics of a slash the same biomechanics of a sucker punch yep. six feet suddenly doesn't seem like anywhere close to enough does it right and nobody had ever shift made that shift so i said listen i said here's a couple other things while we're putting this in our pipe and smoking it right you're safe if suddenly you realize this guy's going to try and kill you and has the means mm. and the intention and the ability and he's charging you and you go, this guy's trying to kill me and you got to get offline. Get, you need 21 feet less the length of the knife in the original demo. You're tracking that, right? Yep. Now, when we did the original demo, did they sign waivers? Were there cameras? Yeah, there were. So is your reaction time enhanced when you know what the demo is going to be? Well, fuck yeah. There's, I wrote a bunch of articles. I don't know if you get my newsletter, but mm -hmm. uh, um, do you remember the ACP, Awareness, Consent, Preparation? Mm -hmm. I write so often. Yeah. But it's like, oh, no, another Blower newsletter. Fuck, delete. <laughs> um, but I wrote this, I, I wrote a, a couple of papers on awareness, consent, and preparation. That if I have awareness and I stay there, I've consented to be there. And if I have awareness and I've consented to be there, I am now prepared. I may not be as prepared as I should be, but it's very different than, you know, someone going, dad, wake up. And you wake up and you go, what's up? There's someone in the house. You're going, whoa, like, like that's different than you taking your money out going, oh, that's $500 out of my fuck, right? And there's a bad guy right there. There's no awareness, consent, or preparation. Um, and to go back to, let's say the drill you do, where you're going this gauntlet drill where people just lose their shit and they're freaking out and you're going there's zero risk that you're going to die you're not going to get dragged to secondary crime scene you're certainly not going to get hurt because we know you know we're not wearing blowers high gear suits and we're not knocking people out right. just this is just an exercise in what we're going to talk about after the <laughs> exercise you'll learn why we did it right um so i said i said to the guys here so i don't lose the track 21 feet, is that the same distance needed if you didn't know that the guy had a knife and he was going to charge you? 
No, it would be 31 feet or maybe 41 feet because now you know when you you know you worked out you worked out the distance backwards because you did one rep here no two no oh it was, and that was the whole the original intent that completely got misunderstood by an industry for decades was um, by acknowledging that you need this much distance this was a way to uh, defend police officers uh, reactions of drawing their weapon at close quarters. It was the idea of saying, hey, we don't have 21 feet. We never have 21 feet. But it just turned into this 21 foot rule, like that, as, as you heard it. Like, you know, and it's like, well, like, what does that even mean? When, you know, I love asking, you know, when did you ever arrest anyone in a 21 foot room that was circular with no furniture? Like, it just never happens. It's right. always like, it's an elevator, it's a stairwell, it's between two parked cars, it's the side of a road. Anyways, without turning this into a cop, podcast how do we turn this back into martial artists is there, we've got all these like theories and hypothesis about how we'll move and when we do stuff but if we take this tooler example a lot of the answers we have for how we would solve a problem are designed in one step two step three step sparring uh, uh, uh coordinated and choreographed drill and we're not ever taking into account the element of surprise, what that does to our complex motor skill system, because the startle flinch is part of your primal gross motor movement. If I do this, I can't at the same time be doing that. I mean, right. and when you flinch, your body contracts for a micro moment and you need to, again, I used the term earlier, re recalibrate. But uh, it was interesting. My whole, my whole point of, of that story was it probably took 10 or 15 years before the law enforcement community got over all that, where, where, you know, I had this guy, Joe, that I was talking to, and we, you know, um, we were just talking this week, and I met him originally in 1993. He came, he comes up after my lecture. He says, hey, I work undercover, and um, your insights are right on the money. However, your bad side manner, you will never get through to these guys. And I was like, what are you talking about? He goes, you can't, you can't tell cops that something doesn't exist. Like, because I would say the reactionary gap doesn't exist. If we had a time machine, I'd go back. When someone said, let's call this the reactionary gap, I'd jump in there and go, wait, <laughs> no, let's not. Let's call it something else, but not the reactionary gap, because it lulls us into a false sense of security. Mm -hmm. I'm okay. I'm here inside the reactionary gap. I've got this. Um, but, you know, it was, it was, you know, guys like that who you know in some ways are like a spiritual mentor you know and i wasn't ready to hear it at the time but he was like hey this is important well, if i'm doing the math right you've been doing what you were doing for 10 12 years you're still kind of young at it at that at that moment when you yeah. started well, yeah not well in 1993 so i'd started 1980 like teaching full-time professionally when you know uh and 93 was 13 years in uh uh as a teaching as an instructor, you know, because I'd started wrestling when I was seven and, and martial arts when I was 12 and a half. Uh, but the, um, um, yeah, young, but still well over a decade. And, and, but, but in ten, 10 years, 10 years felt like a lot when I was younger. You know, here I am in my 40s now and 10 years of anything, it's like, you know, 10 years is nothing. But you remember when you were coming up, you know, You'd be bump into something. Oh, that guy's been training for ten years. That it was seemed always, like forever. That was until always, you'd right. Yeah, oh, ten years, ten years, ten years. You go, and we always were in awe of those guys. Um, um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, like compared to now, uh, you know, here we are, forty plus years later. Uh, the but what's what's interesting is is you got to know your audience, and you know that you know you're you're around teaching if you're teaching kid. You know, we're, we're making a joke about uh, my swearing and my language. I can literally go teach a kids class and never swear. I can go. We just did something for. We have a new program called Spear Care for the uh, mental health community. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah, I want to hear yeah. more about that before we yeah. wrap. Um, yeah, so it's several years in the making. We always had like like. Uh, Healthcare professionals, EMS, mental health, healthcare, 
doctors, uh, you know, coming into our, our, our other programs. But the, the, the standard SPEAR program was really, uh, you know, built around a law enforcement scenario. And so people would come in, they go, hey, I'm not a cop, but can I come in? This is, you know, this is why mm. we, we do an interview or they write us a letter. We go, yeah, this guy can come in, he's legit. And, uh, but the scenarios were really different. And we would always, uh, and we've worked with like, like, um, like NHS, big, big, big friggin' organizations. And they would always say like, you know, it's really good, but like, we don't carry guns and we don't say suspect, you know, we say client and we don't, like, it just turns some of the people off and I'd be like, well, go fuck yourself. Sorry. You know, and, and, uh, <laughs> you know, um, but it, it, it happened enough. And I got approached uh, mid pandemic by somebody who's, who's very well known at the national level. Uh, and uh, he said, Hey, I've been following you for a while. And, and your principles of de-escalation of fear management, and just even the way you go from a nonviolent posture to, deploying the spear is is such a a scalable movement mm -hmm. right i can't scale a back kick you know what i mean by scale i can't right right everyone listening by scale like i let let's say you're 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 doing a deadlift you can scale it i can say hey you're going to do two, 225 pounds and someone has zero range of motion or strength maybe we just give them an olympic bar you know uh you know with with five pounds on it and they're just, right. they're just doing 55 pounds so right. you scale it for you can't scale an elbow you can't scale you know a kick to the balls i'm going to kick you in the balls lightly mm -hmm. well you know but you can scale the actual spear and that's amazing and i've always i've always said that i can change the uh impact zone on my arm and that changes mm -hmm. energy transfer if i supinate the hand i rotate it I hit with the underside of the arm. I can use that to clear somebody. We have like a whole courageous bystander program and mm. where, you, where you're moving. But it's all around how to, you know, my body in a high stress situation is going to gravitate to a primal gross motor move. Um, but anyways, the SPEAR CARE, uh, care is an acronym for Comprehensive uh, Aggression uh, Response Education. And it's much more the... Uh, uh, the whole languaging has, has, mm. has been modified, but I went, you know, when I went to, uh, uh, when I went to do the, the course, I was cautioned by the organizers, you know, Hey, like your tattoos and your swearing and your stuff like that. This is like healthcare, mental health. And like, and I was like, I did this two day pilot course and didn't even say poo poo. You know, um, <laughs> I, I can turn it on and off, but to, to your point, when we started, yeah. it's like, well, I, I want to point out, you, you might know the statistics. I don't, but I, I know the amount of violence that exists in healthcare and even more so in mental health, patient on patient, patient on provider is staggering. And, and I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to guess you, you, you could tell me I'm wrong. I'm going to guess there's a greater number of violent incidents in that space than in law enforcement it's huge it's huge and i don't have the numbers handy and i was just reading them uh, i'm working on the forward for a buddy's book on situational awareness and uh he just listed them so i just i just uh, it was just so many numbers i didn't memorize yeah. it but it's it's it is staggering but it's a subculture because it happens behind closed doors right. where you know we don't know the half of the incidents that happen to cops. We only hear the ones that are 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 supporting the narrative. Um, but the uh, yeah, the the other thing about uh, these events that happen in hospitals and mental health facilities, stuff like that, the uh, the challenge there is that the individuals that are being assaulted, like in, in terms of their aspiration in life was to help others. So in other words, the Hippocratic oath didn't include, you know, throat punches. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't like, I, I want to do no harm. Show me how to do that elbow. <laughs> like it's like, do no harm. And then show me this head, but I love it. So I, like, I, that's one of my jokes when I'm, when I'm talking to them. Right. And it's how do you find a safe and scientific and psychological 
system that that uh, protects the end user who's trying to deploy some sort of uh, uh, psychological or or medical intervention, and then the person just goes, you know, fuck you, boom, and, and you know. So we have we have actually programmed for EMS. So like we 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 bring in an ambulance and training is in and around the gurney in the back. I mean, you're talking about like. I mean, this is such confined spaces, but it's not even like a, like a, if you were the suspect and I was a cop and I go, Jeremy, you have any weapons on you? And you go, just me, I'm the weapon, right? And I'm like, oh shit. But the cop doesn't show up and talk to somebody without recognizing there could be a, a possible altercation, at least in theory. A lot of them are switched off, unfortunately, uh, and, and presume compliance, but the, uh, but you don't get called to some place, right? Um, you know, like there's intel when you go somewhere. It's a cat stuck in a tree, or we heard screaming in in a house, or there's a guy in a bar that threatened so and so. You're going to an altercation, yeah. Where, and 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 so in the healthcare area, the actual origin of spear, right? Which is, uh, and we can't use the word weaponized with with that group. But how do we convert this startle flinch into a protective countermeasure mm. that is makes you safer, but also safer on the client or 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 the individual having you know? What's the response been? You know, what uh, did... amazing, amazing. They love it yeah. because there's a lot of other the companies that were there before are were were usually a law, retired law enforcement who saw a need because you know they all they all interact. But they were coming from a pressure point arm lock. So they're teaching them all this complex motor skill stuff that like a nurse and a doctor, they're not going to train. But the, here's the missing thing. And this actually ties back to the tooler stuff and everything I've been saying for the last two hours is when, when you're leaning over someone and you're going, I need to take this medication. It's really going to help you. And then the person goes, hey, come here, sir. And you lean in and they fucking headbutt you or bite you or punch you like like that's a surprise attack yeah. right so every every initial assault in a healthcare environment is a surprise attack mm. versus your police officer and there's a like a like a drunk walking around you know outside of the bar that's the guy right and then you know and i go sir sir over here can you come towards me keep your hands where i can see them like if the guy runs at you it's a surprise but it's not right because of acp i've got awareness i've got consent i've got preparation i may still get fucked up but you you, you had all the pre-contact indicators there to do it to to be able to intercept and they never get that healthcare yeah. never gets that And the, the, the missing link here is, is, I believe, and this is the whole thing, the, the, uh, the subtle theme here is, you know, for 40 plus years, and you remember, I mean, we talked about this first time we talked, mm. uh, you know, when I was 20, I was asked by a venture capitalist what I wanted to do. And I said, I want to make the world safer. And he said, you don't think that's a little grandiose? And I was like, why? I mean, that was like, like, you know, you, you, if you if you go to some entrepreneurial school right now, they'll talk about what is your big, hairy, audacious goal, something that's so right. And they use that terminology. Yep. Well, in 1980, I said to a venture capitalist who I was introduced to, he said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to make the world safer. And there was no like none of that stuff. And he was a guy we, you know, we stayed friends, but we didn't do anything together because he was like just. How are you going to do that? Mm. And I said to him, based on this black belt interview, I go, I have intuited a system that would make people safer because it's built around how they think and they move. And it would grow and evolve with them. If we build it off of their physiology, their kinesiology, and their psychology, and we just had principal parameters. So if I say to you, listen, force must always parallel danger you need to morally ethically legally answer for your behavior 
You can't just do whatever you want. Well, if I say that in French and I'm teaching in Paris, or I say that in South America, and I've got a translator speaking Portuguese or Spanish or wherever, whatever, or I say that in English to you, it means the same. And if I say that to a special operations guy and I say force must parallel danger, that still resonates with their rules of engagement. So it's interesting, we come full circle, you said, hey, like, how has this changed? We've evolved, our language is more elegant, if I dare say. I've got cooler big words that make me sound smarter than I am, right? And, and uh, uh, you know, we're, we have a small, I was going to use the word army, but I wanted to sound militant. I'm like, you know, given the size of the martial art community, you know, we've got, you know, uh, hundreds of affiliates around the world, but we're very low key. It's, it's uh, the spear system injects itself into other schools. And it's, this is a funny, weird thing. I, 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 for years, I've been saying we're like the fascia, the connective tissue. Why? Because if you don't weather the ambush, you don't get to whatever martial art you're practicing. Yep. And, um, but I say that and I go, and I, so I've got like hundreds of affiliates that love this. And, and they're, I just uh, released a, a, a video of one of my guys in Denmark. You got to see this class. Here's a guy, he's a, 30 year martial artist like probably world-class kickboxer in his heyday uh wing chun crossfit big dude but he saw spear and he went oh my god missing link the fear management mm -hmm. the scenario training and weathering the ambush and using the spear as a bridge to get to our complex motor skills whatever they are and he got it where other people will will, will hear it and see it and go Oh, he's saying my X, Y, Z doesn't work. Yeah. I, and I'm saying nothing works if you don't weather the ambush. <laughs> so, so I, I want to take something you said kind of full circle. And, and you talked about your first year at that, that conference with law enforcement walking out and pointing, you know, you, you use the word ego, you know, what is what's going on there? And to me, what, what I've started to recognize over the last few years, whether we're talking about this sort of stuff or really any, any arguments that exist in the martial arts, if I present something that has validity, that could be of value, that is new information, or even just a better take on it, it means they could have been doing something better. Mm. And a lot of martial artists, end up in these positions of authority and power and you know because of the rank structure that we have they are not questioned right. and so law enforcement is kind of similar you know there's there's rank and they get pushed yeah. up through and if these are trainers then they're that's a good point good point and they say you know i can in order for me to to take what you're you're saying and incorporate it i have to suspend my ego and not everybody can handle that that's a good point. It's funny. You just reminded me of, uh, um, you know, the name George Sylvain. He was a very, he was very famous. I forget his style, but he was the, he was in charge of, uh, in Canada. So I lived in Canada at the time. Uh, he was in charge of Algonquin College in Ontario. Was the main, the, the main main police training institute for Canada. Okay. Um, and he, he was, you know, world renowned and, and but hardcore. The name is familiar. I just, I'm not sure why. Maybe yeah. this connects uh, that. Well known martial arts, old school, yeah. hard. I, I think Q Kushin Kai type, you know, just big, strong. His hands are bigger than my head. Um, but he calls me up one day after my Panther uh, videos were released in 80, we filmed in 86, they were released in 86, 87. In 1987, he calls me, introduces himself, and he's, he asks for permission to show the Panther videos at the police college to show people what real fighting looks like. Mm. And I was like, well, like, you don't, you don't need to call me to ask me if you bought them to show them. He says, well, I wanted to. I just out of respect to you. I was like, well, that's a great honor, you know? And, I, and I'm just learning who he is, and we became friends. And then he... Um, he says to me, and this is the late 80s, he goes, uh, 
I bet you don't get asked to do a lot of seminars, which was true. It was like, you know, I was trying to grow that part and people were like, no. And it ties back to what, what you said, because to, to accept my hypothesis, which is if a stimulus gets introduced too quickly, executive function is hijacked. You can't access your complex motor skills because your cognitive brain is bypassed and you default to your reactive brain. And all that to mean you fucking flinch or you freeze or a combination. And if you study that, you improve mind speed. You stress inoculate. You do it again, you get it again. And ultimately what you're doing is you're conditioning your cognitive brain to pick up on the startle flinch and convert faster. And so uh, there's, a, there's a story I tell in every seminar. I don't remember if I told it to you in our first talk, but uh, my daughter, I've got three kids. My daughter, Madison, just turned 25. So she was seven years old at the time. And uh, middle of the night, I wake up fucking thirsty and I forgot to bring a glass of water to bed. So I get up and our kitchen's downstairs in where we lived at the time. And I'm like rubbing my eyes, adjusting the light as I walk out. And Maddie, who's seven, she's still petite now at 25, but she's tiny and, and she's got, she had this like, like, like porcelain, beautiful skin. And, but her hair at night, remember Blair Witch Project? <laughs> so like I get up, I'm walking out the door and the, the moonlight is coming through the window. And as I walk through my door, we have a carpeted hallway. She's walked out. She's sleepwalking, uh, not sleepwalking, but you know, walking. Just woke up. She's gonna come sneak into bed with mom and dad. I don't see her. I don't hear her. And as I step through, my hand comes down from rubbing my eye, and there's a fucking witch, just to my left, right? Like this, this light on her white skin. Her hair's out like this, and I go, "Don't fuck!" Right? And I, and I, <laughs> I immediately, like, I rotate. I, I, but I micro flinch and immediately my hands, I go, wow, and my hands are out, finger splayed, driving towards her face. She goes, hi, dad, and walks back. <laughs> Doesn't even like no reaction. Yeah. yeah. But I tell this story, I've been telling this story now for, you know, like, you know, in 18 years, 19 years, because when I developed the system, part of the Pavlovian theory behind it is like we can't stop ourselves from flinching, nor would we want to, because it's hardwired survival response. Why would you want to? Why? Because there's there's a bunch of martial artists out there that goes flinching stupid. Why would you want to flinch? I've actually had that question by various. You don't want to flinch, but you do. Again, I asked you this like an hour ago. Have you ever thought to flinch in your life? Have you ever said, "Oh my God, that's coming on my head really fast. I need to flinch." Like, you know, like you pick up on something and it's funny, you could be, you know, walking on a hike in the forest or like on a trail run. And then as you walk around, you see like a, a leaf here or a spider web and you, you like, you, you, your body just moves and you don't ever go. Oh. It's a literal example from my life. Yeah. I hike and a tree branch and it comes at my face and I'm just out of the way. Yeah. It's startle flinch. You turn it into a martial arty slip, but the impetus the like the, the ignition is the start of flinch right and when you start to explore that you can actually um call on and access that speed on purpose and um so it's very fascinating because the hypothesis was was if i flinch and then hit a tactical position that i want to be which is our fingers driving towards the threat intercepting the eye line rear hand up in front of me. So I've gone outside 90, which is the strongest frame the body can hit. I'm blending the fastest thing my body can do at a non-conscious level with the strongest position my body would adopt at a non-conscious level. And now I turn that into something on purpose. In the truest yin and yang metaphor, I've taken this physiological response and then turned it into something hard and protective that I can now defend myself from. I've deployed a biological airbag. I've created a barrier between you and I. That's my opportunity to recalibrate emotionally, psychologically. And, and, and it's, it's, it's magical. And, you know, in the 80s, when I was in my 20s, I discovered it accidentally. But here we are, like, I've got 
I, we've got like videos of cops using this in fucking gunfights in, you know, where people come in there with uh, one guy like running out of a hospital being chased by two security guys as the door, the, we could videotape of this. It's crazy. We use it in our instructor classes. The cops walking by and the door opens and there's three, there's 600 pounds coming at him. Mm. The, the, the emotionally disturbed patient running out these two big burly security guards chasing after the guy. And you see the cop, the door opens, you see him double take because he's not even walking to go into the hospital. It looks like he looks like he's walking by the door. Mm. And then you see him flinch and then he drives the full spear out. You see him extend and drive in, hitting the uh, ED, the emotionally disturbed person across the sternum. And he drives all three guys back into the hospital where they regain control of the guy and this cop had been to a three-hour workshop at a at a at a uh at a SWAT conference mm. like in three hours he was able to make that happen it's just insane you know and why can people learn it so fast is because it's hardwired it's organic it's so cool you know so the um it's uh it's neat, you know, and I'm still as fired up now Can tell. about it. And and as I was in 1988, when I was like, what the fuck's this, right? In the sucker punch drill, so. How can people learn more? You got websites and stuff, right? Yeah, tons of websites. If you go to blowertraining.com, that's my main website, HQ site. You can look at our high gear. You can look at the spear system. You can look at uh, the coaching programs that I do, and you can look at our no fear program. My biggest thing, what's the, you know, I mean, uh, most of the people listening to this are going to be martial artists, right? Yeah. So, um, I would, there's a, there's a few ways to kind of like, if you're sitting on the fence going, he talks a good talk, but I don't know, you know, uh, there are some very, very affordable ways to see if we're full of shit or not, mm -hmm. right? And and you put a bunch of free stuff out too. It's oh not like God. people can't, yeah, yeah, get eighty percent of the way. Yeah, and 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 listen, like if like I just released an article a few weeks ago, came up in a garage gym, uh, where I was talking about there's no such thing as muscle memory, which mm. people what I, mean, I use it all the time. Okay, well, okay, you you you've misinterpreted the concept right it's neural patterns and you do them a lot and so i started talking about this this uh, story where i i was doing a demo for a bunch of navy seals in coronado in 1993 and i ended up like doing the like doing this whole thing in this gun disarm scenario that was more jujitsu than gun disarm because and i explained it i go does anyone know why when I went to do this gun disarm, this Navy SEAL dropped, he changed elevation, I rolled around, but he went right from my groin. And I didn't know this guy, and he was moving pretty fucking fast. I didn't think he was going to stop. So I cranked his arm, rolled him on his back, and as he came over, still holding the gun, I saw the arm bar, and I just stepped into it. I pulled it back, um, I pulled him up here. He started to roll into it. I checked his other foot. I, and this was the coolest thing. I, I pulled his arm up, and I bit his thumb on the gun and his hand opened up and I grabbed the gun with my left hand. He immediately came over, arm barred it with one arm and stuck the gun in his head with the other hand. And he had five of his buddies there that were watching like this. There. And it happened like in three seconds. Yeah. And they were like, now they wanted to know because I was there doing a demo for my high gear. I wasn't there to teach them. I was showing them it was the first prototype of high gear. Now they want to know what I teach and how much I charge and it turned into a bunch of contracts. But the point of the story was, I didn't sleep that night. I was so angry with myself that I went into an arm bar with six guys that I didn't know because I could have gun, done any gun disarm and had the guy up and maybe held him as a shield and a body armor. I could have, I'm a scenario specialist. These guys asked me about gun disarms and then it, but it fell to the ground. How did that happen? So I asked the class, why would I, a scenario specialist, do something that I tell people never go to the ground on purpose if you've got multiple assailants around you? Like everything about the scenario was do mm. something else. And nobody could know, nobody understood why, why I did it. And I said, 
It was 1993. I was in Coronado at Naval Special Warfare. Do you know what else happened in 1993? It was the first UFC. Mm. And I was cage side writing for three magazines, a UK mag, an Australian mag, and a USA mag. Um, I interviewed all the, all the, you know, Shamrock and Gracie and everybody. And then I said to my buddy, Walt Lysak, who I went with, uh, I said, is that fake? I, like, like if you had never done submission before in 1993, when you watch somebody tap out from an ankle lock, like you go, is that, f-? I said, well, is that fake? Like, why would you, ta-? someone grabs your leg and why don't you just sit forward and punch the guy in the head? He goes, well, he has it on, you know, really strong. Like it's, there's a lot of pain. And, and I've known at this point, I'd known Walt for years. And he would always bring me down to do my cerebral self-defense, my nonviolent posture. I never knew that he was a fucking jujitsu wizard. That he knows his stuff. Right. And, um, but I never knew this because we were like, it was always me doing that stuff. So we sit down on the floor in his hotel room and he puts my foot in here and he grabs it. And I got a high tolerance for pain. And I go, I go, dude, if you grab my foot like that, I would lean forward and I lean forward to go punch, to simulate punching him in the head. And he goes, clink. And my body, my nervous system went, oh, fuck. And I was like, fuck, it didn't hurt. But my nervous system recoiled away from me. Yeah. And I didn't have pain. And I said, I said, fuck. I go, that doesn't hurt. Why couldn't I? And I lean and he bends a little bit more back. And I feel my shin bone bend. Mm. And I went, whoa. And he goes, like, if I went a little bit further, and I went, no, no, no let go, let go. <laughs> like, you know, right? The pain is here. Yeah. A little bit more is a tear, a little bit more is a break, but it's it's hairs. It's not yeah. like big jumps. But the point being here is I had no idea about how devastating submissions were. And I immediately said to Walt, I said, dude, how do you know this shit? He goes, oh, my dad taught me all this. I've been doing it for years. I go, you know all this and you never told me? So we ended up, he started coming up to Montreal. And for months, all I did is ground fighting, ground Mm -hmm. fighting, ground fighting, everything, everything in the gym stopped. There was no, it was all, I was exploring everything. And then I was in Coronado. And so this is, and when I say to people, careful what you practice, you might get really good at the wrong thing. I'm talking about me. Here's a scenario expert who developed high gear, who, do, who, who took scenario training to another level, fear management, reverse, been doing scenarios for 13 years, right? 1990 was our first scenario, or 1980 was our yeah. first uh, scenario uh, drill. And I'm here like this, and I could have, when I rolled the guy down, I could have easily, I had the gun, I could have went whack and slammed him in the, in the brake heel, rolled his face, pulled him off, ripped the, ripped the gun off, hooked his head. I, I could have turned it into something just as cool but it would have been scenario specific to everything going on. I'm in a closed room with five other strangers. One guy pulled a gun on me. That's it's, what, it's not what you'd been training recently. Is that, is my, that the punchline? The punchline is this. My, my motor engrams, my neural patterns, my situational awareness was just looking for submissions. And it, and it, so you might like if I say to you, you're let's say you're I go, you're a boxer. Guy comes up to you in the street, he goes, Hey, you know what a strong arm arm robbery is? You go, No, it's when I tell you to give me your fucking money or I'm gonna beat you up. And you're a boxer. Are you gonna think about running or are you gonna go, I'm gonna fucking lay this guy out? Right? I'm gonna hit him. Yeah. As a body, right? So you're going, Well, here's the thing, man. You know, you, and you nail the guy, you hit him with a body shot, up, whatever it is. Now you're a Taekwondo expert and a guy, same scenario. Is the Taekwondo guy going to think I'm going to hit him with a body shot or is he going to think probably going to kick him? I'm going to kick him. Now, the jiu-jitsu guy, guy goes, give me your money. And the jiu-jitsu guy is the jiu-jitsu guy going to go, well, I'm going to fucking, you know, do a, a wheel roundhouse to the head or is he going, I'm going to take this guy down and choke him out. In other words, we create an unconscious bias because of a romantic love affair with our martial art. And that love affair, the dopamine relationship we get when we do our stuff well, and how do you do it well? You fucking do thousands of reps. 
So we come full circle to mm -hmm. my buddy Tom did one million eight hundred, you know, thousand yeah. jabs. He's probably not going to do a spinning elbow when he goes, "Hey man, you know," he's going to fire that jab at the guy because that's the one he did two million times uh, to start to start the fight, and and so we create an unconscious bias to solve the the violent problem with the solution from our menu the menu that we've created so when i say jeremy what's your favorite move you go well if this is happening i love this i love this i love this and i remember our last story because we'll talk forever um when i first started exploring all this when we were doing our fight club scenarios in montreal I would say to people, as soon as you can break contact, you're going to fucking run. We had a juice bar near my exit. And I would say, if you clear the juice bar and get to the front door, that's a police station. That's a hospital. You're safe. But I want you, if you can break contact, I don't give a fuck if it's a shitty palm strike, if the attacker throws a punch and you, and you slip it and he loses balance and you can run. I was trying to break the cycle of ego, pride, and fear keeping us in a sparring range yeah. so we could do our martial arts. I was trying to teach people how to choose safety. And choosing safety, unless you're a cop, and even sometimes with a cop, it's get the fuck out of here and, and call in the cavalry. Um, it, it was, what is the safest thing I could do right now? So we would tell people, break contact as soon as you can and get the safety. And we would have people, and I remember one, the one story that I tell the most, is a guy, this guy named Larry, who's still a friend of mine. Um, he puts his hand up. I just met him. He goes, hey, with all due respect, Mr. Blauer, uh, we all know how to run. We came here to learn how to fight. Like he didn't want to include running as an option. Yeah. And I was like, Larry, the fact that you don't even want to practice running in force on force scenario tells me your ego and pride might keep you in a dangerous situation. You need to practice all of it. We all say head on a swivel, but don't practice uh, situational awareness. We all say verbal de-escalation, but we don't practice that. What we do practice is how to get out of, out of a headlock. And if you do your 10,000 reps of how to get it, what to do with a lapel grab, what to do with a headlock, what to do with a gun in your head, if you do that proverbial 10,000 reps of that, guess what you've done 10,001 reps of? Letting somebody put you in a headlock, mm. letting a gun go in your face. You practice 10,000 sprawls, you're letting 10,001 tackles come at you. Am I saying don't do that? No, you need to develop that skill. But there's another pre-fight, to use the term you used earlier, there's the pre-fight. Funny, Bob Willis, who's a very famous retired cop, he saw me teaching 1995 uh, police uh, event. He comes up to me and he says, you teach the three seconds before the fight everyone else teaches. And that always stuck with me. The three seconds of what the fuck what the fuck shit fuck oh you know and those three seconds where you get back in and if you don't weather that ambush the psychological ambush or the physical ambush you may not get to the the complex motor skill that you that you've been practicing yeah but anyways sorry for no never apologize man that's always we're, we're here we're here for you and this is a this is a great continuation on what we talked about years ago and i hope you know listeners viewers you'll, you'll go back and and check it out and Pay attention to what you're doing because there are few people in the world who are continuing to dig in the way that you are. I mean, you're, I, I can't imagine that if you found something completely revolutionary tomorrow, you wouldn't throw out everything you've done if it's genuinely better. I've and very few people are that way. Yeah. 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 That's, that's, uh, I love that. I got, that gave me goosebumps because I've actually said that to, to my team. Because I, you know, we've had people that broke away who said, oh, Blauer's not evolving. And I'm going, well, it's physiology. We're not, we're not mutating right. physiology. It's kinesiology. It's, it's actual, you know, trust the science. This is actual, this is real science, right? Psychology is real science. Kinesiology is real science. You know, uh, behavior is real, is real science. So I'm not changing anything. I'm just finding better ways to explain it and teach it and coach it. And you're, it you're simplifying it. People want it to get more complicated because that's how martial arts goes. As you advance, you get more complication. And this would be my wish for everybody listening. If you're a beginner, recreational martial artist, I promise you this will make you safer sooner. It has nothing to do with your martial art. 
you know, it, it, it'd be like, uh, well, forget, forget the metaphors, sure. the, but, but it's, it's like, it's like, you've got a, uh, I got one more metaphor. It's like, you've got, you just restored this friggin' gorgeous 67 Mustang mm. and, and, uh, you've restored it and you, you fixed up the engine and you got, everything's new and it's ready to go. It's missing one thing, a fucking airbag. And, and so you can be a great driver and the Mustang in this metaphor represents your physique. You're a, you're a muscle car. You're in shape and you're fast and you're strong and you have torque and you know how to drive. Check this out. You can drive. Now you're sitting at a light playing the music, not texting. And somebody has a medical emergency, a drunk driver, someone's texting or somebody who hates you and your Mustang goes, fuck you. In the moment that that collision happens, does your driving save you? Not really. Does your car save you? Not really. Well, we can be contrarians and say, well, you know, if I'm in a Prius, I'm fucked. But if I'm in a, you know, Ford Raptor, you know, but you get the idea. And I tell people this, if you're a good driver in your car, what saves you in a violent crash is your airbag. And in the metaphor, that crash represents the sucker punch, the surprise attack, that I can be sitting at a light, minding my own business, and it doesn't matter if I'm in a jiu-jitsu car, an Aikido car, a Krav Maga car, a spear car. As soon as you turn, you see a car coming headlong, a head, head, uh, head, what's the word? Head on. <laughs> head on. Couldn't, I was thinking headlights on. Head on to me. I'm like this on the steering wheel, and I realize, what the fuck? And everybody does this. And if you're not sure, talk to a doctor, an EMS, paramedic friend of yours, and ask them where there's always trauma in car accidents for people in the front seat. And they will tell you there's always trauma on the hands and the forearm. That means faster than somebody can hit a windshield, their startle flinch got in the way mm -hmm. of that impact. And so I've just spent decades figuring out how to turn that into a self-defense protocol that regardless of what martial art you do, I go, that's great, but that's beautiful. You got a 67 Mustang. You don't have an airbag, man. An airbag mm -hmm. could save your life. And that's the, that's kind of the metaphor I want to leave on. And listen, we've also been training trainers for, for decades. We would love, we would love uh, to answer any questions we have about people who want to get more involved in sharing this research. Thank you. Thank you, buddy. Always good to talk to you.